Let me uh, introduce you to Dr. Kevin Sabet. He uh, serves as the president and CEO of SAM, which is Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Uh, he's one of the few drug policy advisors that has served uh, to presidents on both the Democrat and the Republican side. So that sort of shows you how level-headed he is. Uh, and he uh, was a huge benefit to us during the Say Note to Dope campaign because they had done all the research. The canary was in the mine in a whole lot of US states, and um, he was getting the research and sending it to us. And in fact, one of the documents on your USB stick is the, Sam's latest report on what's happening in the United States and various states that have legalized cannabis. So that's uh, free to download. Uh, and of course, we got accused of uh, American funding pouring into New Zealand. They never proved it. Uh, and we actually offered to have our accounts audited, but they suddenly went quiet. Uh, so they make these claims, but never want to know. I can guarantee you, unfortunately, ne Kevin never sent me a cent, which I'm still annoyed about. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but Kevin has the dubious, dubious honour of being an American who lives in Vancouver. And if you've been to Vancouver, you'll know that the smell greets you before the view. Uh, a little bit like Chicago when I was there recently. It was a, sh it was a shocker. You just know it, and it reminded me of Colorado. Uh, and so Kevin's most recent book is Smokescreen, What the Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know. Look, I'll be quite honest with you, the cannabis debate will be back. Uh, druggies don't give up on their arguments, um, and we need Kevin to strengthen our spine and uh, remind us of why we voted no and why we need to keep speaking up. So big Kiwi welcome for Dr. Kevin Sabet. No, but it's really an honor to be with all of you uh, uh, all the way down here in, in Auckland. Uh, it's really a pleasure. I've you know, gotten to know Bob over the last couple of years, and what a tremendous, really, ambassador he is for all of you, uh, and uh, you know, bringing the message and supporting, really being in the room with the top leaders in the world uh, in the family movement. So I, I want to give Bob and his staff another round of applause. I also... I also think, and this, this is a, it's a really big deal, and it's, sometimes it's hard to remember, you know, when you prevent something bad from happening, you don't realize, right, because you, you don't feel the pain because you prevented that, that bad thing from happening. You don't realize what it, such a big deal it is. And let me tell you, as somebody who's seen, uh, you know, wins and losses, but unfortunately, the, the, the tide moving towards the legalization of, of cannabis nationwide, and, and I have to tell you, and I'm going to talk about it later, the legalization of all drugs, because that's really what it's about. It's not just about one drug. It's an entire philosophy and religion, actually. We're talking about religions. It is a religion uh, for people. Uh, what you dodged um, and when you voted no as a country, you, your country deserves a round of applause for voting no in that election on say no to dope. So please give your country a round of applause because you have prevented things that you can't imagine what we're going through. And it's not just in Vancouver, it's in New York. If you visited New York City, um, if it's in Los Angeles, it's, it's, it's in Phoenix, Arizona, which is a reliably Republican state now. Uh, it's, it's all over uh, where you, it's not just the smell, it's the marijuana stores now, the pot shops on every corner and the devastation that it's bringing to the community um, and the, the values in terms of how it's devastating those. You, you can't even imagine what that's like. And the bullet that you dodged is enormous. And so I can't tell you how happy we were when we were uh, staying up watching the returns and being in touch with Bob and constantly texting that night. What an exciting time it was. So uh, again, uh, congr con really congratulations. I I'm going to talk, uh, you know, I'm going to, I have a whole sl uh, slide presentation that has a lot of data in it, but that is also in your, uh, in your uh, USB. So I don't want to linger a lot on the data, but I do want to go through some arguments. I think, I thought Lila did a great job of that earlier on the, on the life issue. Um, but I first realized that this was, there was so much ignorance around spe specifically the issue of cannabis when I was traveling the country as a member of the administration in 2011. 
And, you know, at one of the places I went to, I was talking uh, with a group of parents and young people, similar uh, number like this. And, you know, I was talking about the addictiveness of cannabis, of today's cannabis, of the new cannabis. And that's actually really the center of my talk here, because your impression of cannabis is probably wrong unless you've seen it used or used it yourself really in the last two or three years. Um, if you used it once or twice as a, you know, a young person is indiscretion, your experience is, is very, very different. And what you use is very different. So you need to get that out of our heads. A lot of people still think of cannabis as the drug from the 60s. It's totally different. But when I was talking about the addictive nature, I had a, a very self-assured 17-year-old young man raise his hand and he said, um, Dr. Sabet, you are, you are wrong about the addictive of cannabis. Cannabis is not addictive. And I said, okay, well, um, I'm open to your evidence. Please share it with me, you know, share, <laughs> enlighten me about, about what you know. And he said, well, I, I said, how, do you, how are you so sure? How do you know that after seeing all the studies? Because the studies are very clear. I mean, there's not, let me tell you something, there's not two sides to this argument. There, there is a scientific consensus in every single medical association in the world about the dangers of cannabis. This is not a fringe um, opinion, it's fact. Anyway, he said, well, I know cannabis is not addictive because I use it every single day. <laughs> and he followed up with a, a similar one. He said, I know it doesn't impair your driving because on cannabis, I go, you know, and I'll, I'll convert it here. I'll, I, I'll, I go 20 kilometers an hour in a 80 kilometer an hour zone. And that's perfectly safe. Um, if we weren't laughing, we'd be crying because the ignorance around this issue is so widespread. And that really did wake me up to the fact that this was an issue we had to talk about because of course there are dangerous drugs that are killing people, the opioids, the fentanyls, the synthetics, uh, the, the you know, methamphetamine, cocaine, all of those are, are dangerous. But as I said a little bit last night at dinner, or before, uh, yeah, at dinner. Uh, I don't remember what time it is, what last meal I ate, but anyhow, um, excuse me for that. But as I said then to some of you, uh, addiction does not start with heroin, methamphetamine, or cocaine. It starts with the drugs that are the most available. And that's why I commend the campaign here in one of your first campaigns about raising the alcohol age. By the way, when we raised the alcohol age in the United States from, tw from 18 to 21, there have been studies that have shown that we've saved over 95,000 lives since that happened. Um, there is something about the law preventing people from doing things. It's important. It's not the only thing, because culture is really important too, right? But it is very, very important. And so the reason alcohol and cannabis uh, and nicotine products to some extent are those first drugs being used because they're most available and most normalized. And so we have to remember, we have to remember what this really is all about. Um, again, as I was saying, we work with the medical groups around the world. This is certified science. This is not fringe opinion, but we really need to understand what we're talking about when we talk about cannabis. We're not talking about the joint anymore. We're talking about, I mean, this doesn't, you wouldn't, most people would not guess that the top two pictures is the, is the cannabis of today because they would think it's this. They would think it's the joints, uh, which, you know, range from three to 5% potent back only about 20 years ago, not the products that are, although federally illegal in, in my country, and don't ask me to explain how something can be federally illegal and yet states are doing it all the time uh, and there's no action. That's a, it's a mystery of our, of our democracy right now. But um, we're talking about these products. We're talking about these super highly potent products that have evolved as our understanding of agriculture has evolved. We've, we've learned to become better farmers. Um, so I had a, you know, a lot of people tell me, well, Kevin, cannabis is a, simply a plant. It's just a plant. It's safe. They forget that poison ivy is just a plant too. Right? Or I've even heard someone say cannabis is, it comes from God. Why would you be against it? Um, for the same reason I'm against, you know, like great white sharks. They also come from God. I mean, <laughs> the logic here makes absolutely no sense. Because I hate, I'm going to just be honest with you. I know that we're not, you know, have the phones. This is what we call stoner logic. A lot of this is stoner logic. <laughs> and so you can listen to stoner logic or you can listen to the scientific consensus. And right now, the dangerousness of the products that um, young people, and, and increasingly even older people, are using uh, really cannot be understated. We're talking about concentrated THC that looks like honey, basically. Actually, one of the brands is honey, called Honey Oil. 
that you put at the end of a hot knife uh, or, or needle blade and you combust and inhale. I mean, that's not the old stuff from Cheech and Chong movies and the things from 30, 40 years ago. It's, it's new cannabis. It's not what you're thinking. And that's really something important that we need to talk about. And again, there's consensus. This is President Trump's Surgeon General, a friend of ours, talk, calling it a dangerous drug. But I give credit where it's due. This is President Obama and now President Biden's Surgeon General. It's the same Surgeon General who does talk. This is maybe the one thing that they agree on, by the way. Um, but, but the irony is that the people who are so-called anti-cannabis are made to think that, you know, we're some backward-thinking Neanderthals that aren't up with the science and aren't up with the culture. The reality is this is, not, this is settled science. This is not even a discussion anymore about the addictive nature, about the increasing harms with these new products. And uh, I know you all, like, you know, your um, people said you have to have coffee in New Zealand. That's the best coffee, some of the best coffee in the world. So I wanted to think of a good analogy here for the, when you think about the difference in the amount of THC used. I'm going to use a caffeine analogy. The typical marijuana user in the United States 20 years ago before the advent of the legalization movement, the typical user was essentially um, ingesting what would be the equivalent of a, uh, the caffeine found in a little 16-ounce bottle of Coca-Cola. Now, the typical user, which is uh, usually someone in their mid to late teens, is using the amount of caffeine found in 33 grande Starbucks cappuccinos. That's the amount of THC, the active ingredient of marijuana that they're essentially using, the typical user. That's what we've changed. That's what's changed. Uh, it's not just the, 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 the potency of mar marijuana, but it's the amount that is being used every month and every day. And why this is important is because, you know, marijuana, the cannabis plant is very complex. There's multiple components in it. THC is what gets you high. And science has settled the fact that THC binds to the receptors in the brain and the rest of the body that are really critical for, you know, kind of some important things, movement, sensation, vision, coordination, judgment, um, makes sense if you think about it. Think about people who use cannabis a lot. They don't really have the best use of any of those things, but also reward and memory. And reward and memory is really important because that's the addiction center of the brain, okay? Reward and memory. Uh, your body ingests something it likes. You get a reward from it, you know, that flush of dopamine. You, you really like it, and you remember that you like it, so you want to go back to do it despite maybe the fact that you're, you know, stealing from your family to do it or committing crime to do it. This is what addiction does. It hijacks the brain. And so I have a lot of people say, well, we need to have people who are actively using drugs as part of the policy debate. And I'm trying, and they liken themselves to, for example, AIDS activists who, you know, in the 1980s, th there was a big movement of people living with HIV being active in that debate. But there's a critical difference between people living with HIV in the 80s and 90s being active in that debate and people who are actively, not recovered, <laughs> actively using drugs, their brain is hijacked. That's something we have to remember. This is a brain disease, actually. It's different than a disease of, you know, let's say hypertension or heart disease. I don't, you know, some people th say it's the same thing. It's not the same because as a brain disease, even though it is a brain disease, it does re respond to incentives. This is really important when we think about policy. It responds to consequences, actually. Um, and that's different than other brain diseases. You can't tell a Alzheimer's patient that, you know, if you don't remember my name tomorrow, I'm gonna put you in jail for two days. That's not gonna give the, or on the opposite, if you do remember my name, I'll give you a million dollars. That that incentive is not gonna help them remember your name. But with someone who is addicted, there are consequences, both positive and negative, that absolutely affect behavior. So actually, when you have something like a drug treatment court, which is a court with, you know, with doctors and with specialized you know, social workers, but also with consequences, because, you know, for example, if you're convicted of drunk driving and you kill somebody on the road, if you're addicted to alcohol, we're not just going to say, oh, well, you have a brain disease. So you have a disease that you can't help. So there's no consequence for what you did. Of course, there has to be a consequence for what you did. You hurt someone else. But we can also understand that there might be a way that we can help you get off of you know, stop drinking and stop doing this dangerous behavior with the right kind of incentives. And that's the difference between, with addiction as a brain disease versus maybe, maybe some of the other brain diseases. 
what we need to know about cannabis today, first of all, is the new research that's coming out. First, the, the, the top research has to do with mental health. When we talk about this epidemic of depression and anxiety, self-harm, suicide, you cannot divorce the issue of cannabis from it because now young people are using cannabis more than they ever have before and they're doing these uh, horrible things more than they ever have before and experiencing these horrible things more than they ever have before. We know that daily users of today's high potent cannabis are five times more likely to experience a psychosis, basically a psychotic break, uh, which is a pretty big deal, um, than those who don't use. We know that, by the way, the illegal market for cannabis in states that have legalized in the United States and in Canada and other places is booming. So one of the arguments for legalization that you probably heard, and you will hear, as Bob said, this debate is not going away. It's gonna be up to each and every one of you to put pressure on whoever is the next government and whoever's in the opposition to not let this happen through the government because they, they know they can't go to the people. The people have rejected it. And the, the reasons to reject it grow every day as you see in America getting worse and worse on this every day. So they're gonna try and, I think, jam it through government. You're gonna have to be that voice and we're gonna have, you know, of course, all these statistics. But one thing you're gonna hear about is we need to regulate it. We need to regulate it to get rid of the underground market, get rid of the mafia, get rid of the criminal organizations. Well, I have news for you. In the United States where we've legalized marijuana in the vast majority of states with po big populations, uh, the mafia hasn't, you know, all gone to medical school or something because they got out of a job. <laughs> They don't go to, you know, they don't go to dental school. Or they, 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 they have grown. Why? The demand grows. The state cannot fill that demand. And by the way, when the state tries to fill that demand, they tax it because that's how they justify doing it. We'll get tax revenue. I'll talk about that in a minute. We'll tax it. We'll put rules. We're going to be responsible. We're going to, you know, and as they're doing that, the mafia is laughing all the way to the bank because the demand has risen. And by the way, last time I checked, there still will be an age limit even if you legalize it, unless you legalize it for 12 year olds. And as long as there is an age limit, there's gonna be that gray and that black market, like there are for tobacco cigarettes. I'm a big proponent of tobacco uh, raising that age. I know that you know, here you're having these discussions about a complete prohibition of, of tobacco, which by the way, how can you have that discussion? <laughs> At the same time, they are having a discussion to legalize cannabis. Think about it. Which, by the way, tobacco's pl plenty bad, don't get me wrong. In, in my country, it still kills 400,000 people a year. We're still being deceived by an industry that's now just moved to these vaping products. So I, I don't, don't, I have, there's no love lost with that. But with cannabis, we're talking about something else. We're talking about something that actually deranges the mind. It's different. Tobacco's bad. It doesn't make you crash your car and kill somebody. It's bad. It doesn't cause psychosis and schizophrenia. It's bad. It does not hurt uh, the rest of you know, uh, uh, um, your body the way that cannabis actually does. So although it kills you through lung cancer, although you don't die from an overdose, that's another thing you're going to get is, well, Kevin, fentanyl and heroin kill people. Cannabis has never killed anybody. How many of you all heard that? Never killed anybody? With that logic, tobacco's never killed anybody either. You don't have an overdose from cigarettes. You can't, you can't uh, smoke 50 cigarettes, 100 cigarettes in a sitting even if you tried to kill yourself. It, do, it just doesn't work. Why? There's a simple scientific reason for it, actually. Uh, what controls your breathing is in your brain stem. And sadly, we have a lot of opioid receptors in our brain stem, essentially. That's why opioids contribute to overdose. We thankfully don't have cannabinoid receptors back there, and we don't have receptors from nicotine either. So thank God we don't. But plenty of people are still dying from the indirect effects of, of tobacco, just like they are from cannabis. So you really have to think about that hypocrisy. But the underground market is growing and grows. The, the, the criminal organizations love it. They're also very diverse, by the way. You may not know this. Do you know what the number one source of income for Colombian drug cartels is? It's not cocaine. It's not fentanyl. It's not heroin. It's the legal mining and logging industry. They're, they have learned to undercut that market and they make more money there than they do from cocaine, Colombia. So it really does require an understanding of this. And in the different states that have tried this, they're not selling the majority of uh, their market is not from quote unquote legal. You also hear about the social justice argument. How many of you have heard that argument, right? We're criminalizing people. Okay, first of all, I don't think anybody here is calling for putting people in prison who are smoking a joint or young kids who are trying cannabis. I don't think we're, we're calling for that. So that's a false dichotomy as it is. But just in case you wanted to check, 
prison populations have not decreased in the United States because of cannabis legalization. Why? People aren't in prison for cannabis. They never were. Now, some high-level dealers, etc. yes. With other crimes, yes. But for the simple possession of marijuana, that is a, one of the biggest, probably the biggest, urban myth about, quote-unquote, cannabis legalization. In fact, I would argue, folks, cannabis legalization is a social injustice. Because what you're doing to communities that are disadvantaged, who are already dealt a difficult hand in life, who frankly need more help, all the help they can get to raise them up, you're basically saying to them, smoke cannabis. Now, how is that going to help those populations? Tell me. It's, it's ironic that, in my, at least in my country, the biggest proponents for cannabis legalization are honestly like libertarian white guys that like to smoke weed. And all of a sudden, they put on a little button, social justice button, when, when it's convenient. But when you go to these communities, let me tell you, these communities of Compton, California, where they literally invented the term chronic, Snoop Dogg, etc., they have rejected marijuana shops in that community of Compton. You go to places like Washington, D.C., you talk to the black community there. I'm talking about, if you know, D.C. is four quadrants, southeast being the poorest, black, northwest is Georgetown, it's the diagonal opposite. You go to northwest, plenty of people want to legalize cannabis. They, they think it's great. You go to southeast, you talk to the moms and dads in the black communities, the last thing they want is legalized cannabis. They said, listen, the only time you want to talk about social justice is when you want us to have more access to drugs. That's the time you want, because they say, we're going to create black entrepreneurs. That's what the cannabis industry says. We're going we're to give licenses to minority and ex-felons. That's going to work out well. <laughs> now, this is said with a straight face. I mean, this is crazy. We're going to give licenses to the black and brown communities to make up for the war on drugs. So you're telling me the time that we are going to help these communities in my country is just when it has to do with cannabis? It's actually insulting. And when you look at Denver, Colorado, or Los Angeles, California, and you look at the poorest neighborhoods, this is a Denver inlay, you can't see it from where you are, but it's a census inlay and an inlay of um, where the pot shops are concentrated. They're concentrated mainly in communities of color because those communities don't have a voice to opt out, see? So in Compton's kind of an exception. They don't want it, they got it voted out. And you can vote out a pot shop in your community with most of these US laws. So they can't force you in your neighborhood to have one if you vote them out. What does that mean? It means the people that voted for legalization on the statewide level who thought they were being really advanced and progressive and smart and college educated people, yeah, we should do that. We don't want people in prison. They think they know the issue. They voted yes, but then when you ask those same people, oh good, we're gonna put a little marijuana store by Johnny's daycare. They're like, no, 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 we don't want it over here. Do it over there. They know it's bad. So actually, ironically, it's the upper class communities in the US that have voted out the marijuana stores and the communities that don't have the organizing power and have a lot of other things that they're dealing with that have unfortunately and usually ignorantly didn't even know it was coming, they have the pot shop. So this is not helping communities of color at all. It's hurting communities of color. It might be helping celebrities with, you know, if anything goes wrong, they can go to, you know, Malibu treatment for $100,000 a month, literally. But it's not helping the kids in the ghetto who are trying to get out. Is marijuana is not that drug. It's an A motivator. When's the last time you heard that cannabis motivated someone to do something? <laughs> Think about it. But this is what we're essentially consigning our kids to by saying it's harmless. Because unfortunately, the baby boomer generation just remembers they all use it in Woodstock. And then, you know, all of a sudden they had kids in the 70s. And they said, whoa, or in the 80s, they said, wait, we don't want to do this anymore. So we, we changed culturally very quickly on this issue. But now those baby boomers are like, oh, yeah, well, we did it in the 60s. My kids are moved out. Eh, it's fine. Let's vote for it. That's what's driving this. And a lot of money from interest groups that I will talk about. You might be asked, is marijuana a gateway drug? I talked about that a little bit. Let me tell you the, the short cliff note answer to this, and I have a lot of data that we won't go through, is essentially it's true that most people who try cannabis will not go on to other drugs because they actually try it and don't really like it. It's kind of the dirty little secret. It's not really that pleasant to a lot of people. But for a growing number of people, because it is a lot more potent than it used to be, it is becoming addictive. And if you are using cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, there is a 97% chance that you started with cannabis. So you can, I'm just being straight with you with the science. You can look at it either way. 
glass half full, glass half empty, but you cannot ignore the connection. And people are asking, well, why is it connected? And so the legalization lobby will say, well, it's connected because you have dealers that, you know, they deal with cannabis and then they give someone methamphetamine and then they, that, that's like from a movie. That's not how it works. It's not like a guy with a trench coat that has drugs here and drugs there. Which one do you want? That's not how it works, folks. Most kids get cannabis actually from their family members or friends for free. It's not a scary dealer in the corner. But since they've used that, actually their brain gets used to it. Their brain one day, some of them says, you know what, this isn't cutting it anymore. And I tried this, why don't I try something better, something stronger? That's, that's this connection. And scientists are confirming that, that the biology of the brain, the brain is essentially wanting something more than even cannabis can give. That's why you then go on to try other things. You've dipped your toe in the water, the water feels pretty good, but you really wanna get your whole body wet. That's what we're talking about. It's not about the dealer who, you know, introduces another drug, and if only we legalize, we get rid of the dealer, therefore they won't use cocaine. It's not how it works. So there are a lot of studies showing that daily users of cannabis, yearly, monthly users, are astronomically more likely, many times over, more likely to use other drugs. And I don't like the use of the word hard and soft drugs that sometimes we hear because... These are all drugs that affect the brain. And for some people, a cannabis addiction is much more difficult to overcome than even a heroin addiction. We have medication for a heroin addiction. A heroin addiction, very few people can deny. Family members can't deny it. It's something that when it gets bad, it gets really bad. With cannabis, you can actually, people are in denial about it. That makes it worse in some ways. There's no medication to treat it. Treatment centers actually don't really know what to do. It's very, very difficult. Um, so. There's a lot of that. And in, in also in the U.S., we're seeing, and this is actually, these are quotes from young people saying that marijuana wasn't enough for me. So we're seeing marijuana connected with the opioid problem, too. But you might be thinking, how, how sort of, how did this normalization all come about? What is this really about? And what it, what it is about, folks, is the almighty dollar. I hate to say it. It's about people who want to make money off of your kids' brains. That's why we're having this discussion about legalization right now. It's not because we just all of a sudden said, you know what, we need to legalize cannabis because we like to use it or social justice. No, it's because there is a concerted movement that started, ironically, by the hippies of the 1960s and 70s, the counterculture, who hated Wall Street. I mean, they would look at a picture of these three guys and puke. That's the irony of the whole thing. But the rea and I went to Berkeley, so I know what a hippie looks like. And um, just a side note, you know, so I started a student group too. Lila was talking about student group. My student group was called Citizens for a Drug-Free Berkeley. It was about as popular as the Coalition for a Wine-Free France. But, <laughs> but I learned a lot of lessons there too. So we could talk about that maybe in the Q&A about how to be scrappy in this, because we have to be. So if I can do this in Berkeley, by the way, you all can do this in your communities, I promise. But the reality is, the hippie movement, it honestly was about, well, we don't want to get arrested for smoking a joint now and again at a park or we're listening to the, like the Grateful Dead or whatever. That is not what it's about at all anymore. Just like marijuana's changed, this movement is totally different. It's guys that look like me. It's, it's not the long hair hippies. In fact, the smart long hair hippies who want to legalize, they've cut their hair, bought a suit, took in a sh taken a shower, and now they're being taken seriously in Washington. They weren't being taken seriously before. It was kind of a laugh, it was a joke. I mean, Cheech and Chong, you wouldn't be taking them seriously on Capitol Hill. But that's not who's representing this anymore, although they are actually in the business now too, trying to make money like everyone else. So what we're seeing is history repeating itself. What history am I talking about? The grand old history, I'm gonna go back to tobacco. Do you know that tobacco was not deadly before the Industrial Revolution? We've been using tobacco for a very long time, folks. It was a mild throat irritant. We didn't, uh, it was used in a pipe. It was used occasionally. The way it was ingested in the lungs, very different. And then in the Industrial Revolution, we figured out the invention of the, the biggest weapon of mass destruction we've actually ever produced, if you think about it, in terms of what's been used. And that's called the cigarette. What we'd learned with the cigarette is that we could isolate those chemicals that were really addictive, add a bunch of other ones that are really addictive, mix them all together and put them in a cigarette. It wasn't like the old tobacco farming. It completely changed. 
And after the Industrial Revolution, there was the Advertising Revolution. So you now had Madison Avenue, you know, partnering with these new companies. So what did they do? Well, they recruited doctors to say that <laughs> tobacco was healthy. One of my favorites is, um, I don't have this one up here, but it's Dr. Batty's Asthma Cigarettes. <laughs> That's a real thing from the late 1800s. I didn't make that up. So they got the doctors on board. It's healthy. It's medicine. Oh, that sounds familiar. No one ever came up with medical cannabis before, right? And if you have questions about medical cannabis, we can talk about it during the q and I'm not talking about that today, but I'll just, the short version is it's a completely, it's a made up term. It's, just not, it's not scientific. There are components that could be helpful. I'm not saying those don't exist. Those aren't helpful. They are. But you don't smoke a joint or inhale this crazy stuff or get gummy bears where you don't know what's in it. That's not medicine. Anyway, they recruited doctors. Then they recruited a athletes. I mean, you can't get better ones than Jackie Robinson, and other folks, actors. Then, uh, then they, uh, and, and now the marijuana industry is doing the same. They're recruiting uh, uh, doctors. They've already done that with medical marijuana. Now they're recruiting celebrities. And this has become a business. So that means they're now in the addiction business. It's what I call addiction for profit. You don't make money in the addiction business if people use your product occasionally or responsibly. That's why I always laugh at the alcohol industry's thing at the end of the commercials, enjoy responsibly. Do you know if everyone enjoyed responsibly, they'd make no money? <laughs> so they don't, but they don't need everyone to be irresponsible. They just need like 20% of you to be basically alcoholics. They live off that model. And it's the same thing with cigarettes. It's the same thing with cannabis. It's the same thing with any of these other addictive products. So now we have, thanks to legalization, Santa Claus promoting cannabis on a busy freeway in California. We have rainbow colors. We have gummy bears. We have ice cream. And I, my favorite quote on this is The Economist. Uh, while laboratory animals are an expensive way of understanding the risks of cannabis use, North Americans come free. You're welcome. But it's addiction for profit. Did you know that it only, it's what we call Pareto's rule in public policy 101. Pareto's rule essentially says 20% of the actors of anything are responsible for 80% of the output. So what that means is it takes 20% of the American population to be addicted to cannabis to produce 80% of the revenue for these industries. So they don't need everyone to be addicted. They just need a certain percentage of us and they make tons of money. It's how alcohol makes money and on all these other, uh, that's all the, in the United States, 10% of Americans drink 75% of the alcohol. This isn't the same thing as gonna be here. So that's the, that's the economic model. It's addiction for profit. That's why it is disgusting to talk about it like social justice or economic justice or freedom. It's nothing of the sort. And again, we're not saying we want to throw people in prison if you make a mistake as a young person, but we want to acknowledge that we got to get them help to get them off of it. So it's this false dichotomy that we're being demonized. And let me tell you, it doesn't stop at cannabis. Guess what? We're just legal. Guess what? Colorado, the first state in the country 10 years ago to legalize cannabis. Guess what? Guess what they just legalized last year? Psychedelics. That's the new one, right? ketamine, MDMA, LSD. Again, it's this whole, the hippies are like spinning in their graves now because it's, it's, it's high level tech people now investing in it. Some people say, well, psychedelics have medical purposes, especially mental health and opening up your mind. Listen, I'm not against the medicinal, the proper medicinal use of some of these plants that can be turned into medicines. I'm not against that under proper supervision and proper protocols. But that is not what this legalization is all about. If it was, they would go through the proper health system to get a drug approved. But when you ask them to do that, no, no thank you. We're gonna follow the medical marijuana model, which means we're gonna totally go around regulatory structures, bring it to the people, throw a cancer patient on TV, call uh, George Soros or any of the other four billionaires that are funding this, I'm just gonna call it out, uh, to write a check to get them on TV. And then we're gonna go up against, you know, those rich parents and teachers who don't want this to happen. And guess what happens? You get outspent 35 million to one, like we were outspent in California in 2016. But now this is happening for psychedelics and it's happening for other drugs. 
Um, this is actually just a, just a timeline, a little bit of legalization support. But essentially what happened is we had three billionaires in the 1990s say, man, we want to legalize cannabis, but no one's that interested. I mean, Reagan kind of ruined it for all of us. You know, the movement to legalize really fell away in the 80s and early 90s. Reagan and Bush, they ruined it. They said, what can we do? They came up with the term medical marijuana. Put the word medicine in front of it. Appeal to compassion. And you can change minds, even though the scientific community was saying this is not medicine, folks. But no one was listening to them. I mean, there's no PR in PhD. I hate to break it. As a PhD, I can tell you that. We're really bad at getting our findings out. We're, we don't do PR. That's not what we do. So the average American, unless they're reading the New England Journal of Medicine, which the last time I checked they're not doing, is easily manipulated by politics and money. Very easily. So a couple of billionaires essentially bought public opinion. They did a wonderful job. And uh, then all of a sudden, the legalization movement began to, to, began to um, you know, pick up steam. And where are we now? Well, we're in a place where, I don't know, maybe it's like one of the, other than Hawaii, one of the closest states to this country, Oregon, has now decriminalized all drugs. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, in Oregon, if you had a small amount of drugs before, you were not going to prison. So it's sort of a misnomer because you were probably going to go to treatment. That's the thing that people don't understand is they think that everyone with a tiny amount of any drug, if you're addicted and have a medical problem, you're all in prison. That's, that's actually a total misrepresentation of the real system. But anyhow, they live off of these, fa these fears and they, the, the pro-legalization community relies on this kind of ignorance because they can say, we don't want a disease to be treated with the criminal justice system. It should be decriminalized. Well, what that really means in Oregon, for example, is that every drug is essentially legal. What it means is if you get caught with heroin or cocaine, you basically are given the opportunity to call a phone number to get treatment if you feel like it. And if you don't, you have to pay a whopping, whopping, very difficult to pay, $100 fine. Which, if you don't pay, there's no follow-up. Now, this happened two years ago. What is the result so far? Guess how many people under this program who are being cited have actually entered treatment? Not completed it, okay, not completed it, entered it. 0.85%, not even 1%. But now the activists are saying, we actually, you're right, Kevin, this doesn't work. We need to legalize it actually so they can buy it somewhere. That's the real problem. So this is how they're moving. They're pushing what would they call safe injection sites. I'm not sure if you have anything of the sort here, you do where it's essentially a room where you go and inject or use drugs, and they think that that's the humane way to deal with addiction. Folks, uh, that's not a humane way to deal with a spiritual and physical and biological disease. It's not to prolong the disease, make it a little bit safer. I mean, that would be like telling somebody who, you know, is engaged in domestic violence, you know, um, we don't wanna hurt you either, so why don't you, we'll give you boxing gloves, make it a little bit safer when you hit somebody. That's what we're doing. It, 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 we are making it, making a, a inherently unsafe activity. We're pretending to make it safe by giving people safe spaces to use. That's not humane. That's not the way out of addiction. There are hundreds of millions of people in recovery today that are testament to the fact that you can overcome this with all kinds of supports. But they are pushing this. So now where I live in Vancouver, which is a very beautiful city, but it is a city that has more uh, overdose events than even the United States. And uh, I don't know if I can go back. Now you have drug user unions. I promise you I didn't make that up. They're called the Vancouver Network of Drug Users, Vandu. That's a real thing. They actually used to get government money. These are people currently engaging in heroin and cocaine and methamphetamine use who are now giving away on the streets of Vancouver free heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine because they say the injection site is not enough, free needles are not enough, decriminalization. I mean, people haven't been arrested for drugs in Vancouver since I don't know when. Probably Justin Trudeau's dad was prime minister, maybe before that. It's been a very long time. <laughs> well, no comment. But the point is... They're now giving this away, and they have the worst overdose numbers in the developed world, much worse than the United States. 
which is considered like the epicenter of it from raw number perspective because of fentanyl. And that is where they're going with this. So this is about the legalization of all drugs. So if you think cannabis isn't a big deal and I can't convince you that it is and the scientific consensus can't convince you that it is, at least understand that heroin legalization would be a very big deal. But that's where this is leading. And I'm not just you know calling sort of wolf here. This is what's actually happening. So in the US, we have 30 overdoses for 100,000. In British Columbia alone, it's 46 per 100,000. My point is things can get a lot worse. Uh, you might think it's bad now. Oh, we need to radically change something. We need to legalize drugs. Actually, you can make it worse by doing that. You might have heard of, how many of you have heard about Portugal's experience? Heard a little bit about Portugal. Um, you hear this a lot. Let's treat it like Portugal. Well, first of all, Portugal did not legalize drugs, number one. They essentially have a system where if you're caught with drugs, you go to an administrative body. They determine whether or not you need treatment. Public drug use is not tolerated at all. They have shut down open-air drug markets. Public drug dealing is not tolerated. Um, by the way, they have mixed results. It's not all great, but we, also, we have to also understand that culture has a lot to do with outcomes as well, as I said earlier. It's not only policy, it's both. Um, so a lot of people say, let's look at Portugal and legalize drugs. You just can, they didn't legalize drugs in Portugal. So if you ever hear that, you can tell people that. But we do know things that do work. There are things, like I mentioned, like drug courts. Incentives work. In the United States, we have thousands of drug courts that have helped thousands of people achieve recovery. Why? Because there was a carrot and a stick. A judge said, I'm going to expunge your record uh, you know, for your petty theft related to drugs, but that's only if you go and complete treatment and you drug test every week and we make sure you're not using. That's very powerful motivator. But we've, we've, we want to take it away from the criminal justice system entirely because we think, well, it's a disease like heart disease. You wouldn't go to a judge if you had a heart attack, so maybe you shouldn't for addiction. Addiction is different. You know, you don't steal from your grandma because you have heart disease. You know, right? You don't try and kill somebody because you have diabetes. It's different. And while it is a brain disease, we need to understand those dynamics. But we need more things like drug courts. There are a lot of ways, and I don't want to be incarcerating a lot of people. So we can, we can actually reduce both incarceration and crime and drug use with innovative programs and strategies that work. We're never going to get it to 0%, folks. But the, for the people that disparage a goal of a drug-free world, you know, what about the goal of a conflict-free world. We hear about that all the time. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but I think it's a good goal. Or a, you know, a racist-free world. We hear about that all the time. I want that too. Probably not going to happen anytime soon, but a good goal. We have a goal in the United States of a cancer-free country. That's going to take a very long time to do, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't aspire. And what the legalization movement and the pro-drug movement is doing is lowering our standards our standards of what we think about a human being should be, our standards of what the role of government and what society and culture should be doing, to the point that we're not even allowed to talk about the idea of a drug-free world because it's quote-unquote unrealistic. Well, folks, I would tell you, we have to move towards that for the sake of our future generations. That means robust solutions around prevention. Prevention is worth more than anything, because if you can prevent something from happening, you don't have to deal with it. And it's very hard to deal with it. Intervention and treatment so that you get early, you identify drug use early. You don't just wait till someone's on the street and addicted. Uh, recovery, international efforts, smart enforcement. There's a lot that we can do. I'm going to end with this. We hear a lot about from the community that unfortunately wants to prolong drug use. We hear from them. We need to just meet people where they're at. And that's it. You've heard that before. Meet people where they're at. And I would argue, yes, of course, by definition, we never want to turn our back against anybody. Of course we will meet people where they're at. But for the love of God, we cannot leave them where they're at. That is what our goal should be. And you all need to understand that this debate is not going away. It is central for our kids' futures. And we need you as ambassadors in the community to talk about it and to make sure that our elected officials, our decision makers, the people that want to come to this country and make a ton of money off of our kids' brains, that they are held to account. Thank you so much.